Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mark Becker, Provost of the University of South Carolina, and on behalf of President Andrew Sorensen and the entire Carolina family, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2007 Johnson & Johnson Healthcare Lecture. The School of Law has proudly hosted the Johnson & Johnson Healthcare Lecture on issues relating to health law since 1999. This lecture series provides an excellent opportunity for faculty in medicine, law, public health, the humanities, and the sciences to work together to see that important issues relating to health law are discussed in a public forum on our campus and for the general public. On behalf of the university, I express our sincere appreciation and thanks to Johnson & Johnson, and particularly to Mr. George Irving for their generosity in underwriting this lecture series. Thank you very much. Past speakers in the Johnson & Johnson lecture series have included, for example, Vice Admiral Richard Carmona, Surgeon General of the United States, Randolph Smoke, President of the American Medical Association, Henry, Henry T. Greeley, Professor of Law at Stanford University, and Judith Darr, Professor of Law at Whittier Law School, and Dr. David Hyman, Special Counsel to the Federal Trade Commission and Professor of Law at the University of Maryland, and from the private sector, Dr. Thomas Kasky, CEO and President of Cogene Biotech Ventures. Past lectures have considered timely topics ranging from human cloning, mapping the human genome, the Federal Patients' Bill of Rights, HMO liability, malpractice liability, to the obesity epidemic that vexes policymakers and citizens alike today. Today, once again, the Johnson & Johnson lecture brings a timely and challenging topic to our attention and for our consideration. What to do and expect if the unthinkable were to happen, preparing for a pandemic. To give you some idea of just how timely this topic is, consider. In the March-April issue of Foreign Affairs, a policy journal, not a law journal, not a health journal, but a policy journal. In the March-April issue of Foreign Affairs is an article by Osterholm of the University of Minnesota entitled, Unprepared for a Pandemic. It touches on many of the issues that we'll consider today. The March 1 issue of Vaccine, a medical journal, public health journal, includes an article by Zimmerman of the University of Pittsburgh entitled, Rationing of Influenza Vaccine During a Pandemic, Ethical Analyses. And not long ago, in November, December 2006, in an issue of the American Journal of Bioethics included an article by Winia of the American Medical Association entitled, Ethics and Public Health Emergencies, Rationing Vaccines. I could go on and on in citing other articles in mainstream journals of broad scope, policy, health, medicine, law, and ethics, but I think you get my point of both the breadth, the scope, and the magnitude of this issue and how timely it is today. It's challenging many of the best minds concerned with the public's health. They are challenged to craft answers that are neither easy nor comfortable. Again, I want to thank Johnson & Johnson and Mr. Irving for making this possible. Today's lecture is indeed timely. It's indeed important. And I think we will hear um, from our speaker that it's indeed terrifying to think about somebody is going to have to make decisions, quite likely, not about whether a few individuals will live and die, but quite possibly about whether or not millions of individuals will live and die, or in particular, who among millions, among hundreds of millions, and in fact on a global scale among billions, will have the opportunity to be protected by the vaccines that exist and those who will not get that opportunity. I look forward to hearing what our speaker a recognized expert of international distinction has to share with us today. So I now turn the podium over to Professor Jacqueline Fox to introduce him. Welcome. Thank you, Provost. And I'd like to add my thanks to the Johnson & Johnson people for funding this. Alexander Caverin is uh, really someone marvelous to be coming here to uh, talk to us about this. He recently served as the first director of ethics, trade, and human rights and health law at the World Health Organization in Geneva and was the first person to serve in that place. Prior to that, he's been on a number of presidential commissions and, and committees of that, that level in this country trying to resolve very important bioethical problems. He has the expertise in this field. Plus, he's taught at uh, Georgetown, Pennsylvania, University of Southern California Schools of Law and Health Law, and uh, Torts, which I always think is a great uh, course package. <laughs> and um, I hope that you listen to him and think about the questions you might have, because we're going to have some questions afterwards that he brings to this. So um, one other point, which uh, happened this summer, 
is that a number of people got together trying to come up with a way of approaching how we're going to deal with the financial implications of what we do to try and limit the spread of avian flu. And uh, Professor Capron was one of the people on that. And they've come up with a manifesto, which I think is very romantically titled the Bellagio Manifesto. And um, it's very important, because right now we're cutting the livelihood of a number of people in Southeast Asia to try and prevent the spread of avian flu, which is one of the sources of this. So there are innumerable implications. So please listen carefully and think about what you'd like to ask at the end of the talk. And I present you Professor Alexander Capron. Thank you, Professor Fox, Provost Becker, Mr. Irving. It's a pleasure to be here at the, the other USC. Uh, and uh, I will indeed today be talking about some of the ethical challenges in preparing for a pandemic. Another challenge I have will be in, in going through this rather rapidly. Professor Fox told me that she did her hour and a half torts class today in half an hour, and some of you may have been in that class today and realized the lightning speed that was necessary. I have a lot that I'd like to get through, and I'm going to give uh, m most of my attention to the topic which was highlighted by the provost, uh, the, the topic of allocation, but I will address some other topics. I want to begin by asking why is there a need to prepare, and that has two parts. That is to say, what is the impetus in medical terms, in, in terms of uh, a public health emergency, and the emphasis on preparation, because this is not one of those problems which we'll be able to deal with once it arises. Uh, this is, if we have a pandemic, it is going to be fast moving. And I also want to suggest, from a public health point of view, uh, the importance of uh, preparation which requires involvement of the communities. I want to say a few words about the role of ethics and to a certain extent human rights and their relationship to legal reasoning. I'll describe the four ma major areas in which WHO is working on this topic, uh, work that I was involved in obviously when I was there and continue uh, to give advice on. Uh, I think that overall these different problems are all manifestations of the central ethical conundrum of the interests of individual versus the interest of the group. And I will suggest at the end that the way forward involves preserving our moral foundations, uh, and that is mostly going to be around fair processes rather than one particular set of outcomes that is fair in all circumstances. So what are those four topics? The first uh, is the question of eth uh, equitable access to health care in a pandemic, the question of how to allocate vaccines and antivirals. Uh, we will, by any estimation, not have anywhere near enough vaccines. Uh, we already are short of the number of uh, doses of antivirals, uh, the Tamiflu that uh, you hear about. Um, and although production by Roche is uh, at as brisk a pace as they can make it, uh, and there are some generic versions being manufactured, um, we will not be able to treat all the people in the world who would need treatment. The second set of issues has to do with ethical and human rights issues that arise in the public health arena. Uh, the public health actions here begin with surveillance and the dissemination of information. Those will have consequences uh, for the people and the countries and regions uh, identified as the sources and then as it spreads the uh, routes by which a pandemic would spread. Uh, it will then have uh, issues as well for what actions are taken uh, to cut animal to human transmission and then what actions are taken by way of quarantine or the like to uh, prevent human to human transmission. Uh, and the new international health regulations of the World Health Organization are going to be uh, put into place early if needed. They will come into effect officially uh, in June of this year, but if we were to have a pandemic before then, countries have agreed to implement them voluntarily in the meantime. The third set of issues, about which I will say less because of time, involve obligations uh, of and obligations to uh, healthcare workers in a pandemic, and these include not only physicians and nurses, but 
potentially people uh, on the front lines providing other services, um, even delivery or cleaning services for hospitals, and of course the people involved in making uh, vaccines. I want to ask a little bit about the origins of such obligations to the extent that they arise because we're dealing with professionals who have certain ethical traditions versus people who have abilities that society needs. Now, these can be in parallel, but they may be fairly distinct. I mean, garbage collectors do not have ethical traditions of obligations to serve, but they might be in a situation where their service would be as important uh, as that of doctors and nurses. And finally, say a few words about obligations among and between countries and of international organizations, uh, since there will be not only an unequal distribution within any society of the risk, but there is certain to be an unequal distribution of risk uh, among countries and of their own ability uh, to meet the needs of their citizens. Why then, to deal with the first question, is there a need to prepare? Influenza, uh, on a global basis, already is responsible for about a million and a half deaths a year. And most people who die of influenza die because of the burden that influenza places on their system uh, when they already have cardio, uh, ca cardiac and pulmonary problems, principally, uh, or other things which affect uh, their endocrine system or the like, so that people who are at greatest risk are the very young who have no immunities uh, and whose systems are less strong, and uh, the old, as well as those who are uh, compromised by existing pre-existing conditions. And the figures uh, uh, on death from any cause, of course, are always controversial. Why do we count something as an influenza death versus uh, a death caused by um, underlying uh, heart problems or lung problems or the like. Uh, this is actually something to keep in mind when we look back at historical data because some people have done a reanalysis of the 1918 Spanish flu, which killed uh, by varying estimates, I mean, the, the public health data are not what they would be today, anything from 20 to 50 million people, and that's a pretty wide range, although it's only a two and a half fold difference there. Um, sometimes estimates uh, of what something will do are 10 or 100 times in, in a range. But we don't know exactly how many people died, and it has certainly been suggested that if you look at historical data, there was, uh, to a certain extent, simply an acceleration of deaths that probably would have occurred over a two or three year period, and they uh, occurred all at once. But the fact that some of these people, or maybe even most of them, would have died within that period does not lessen the impact of sudden deaths caused by uh, a pandemic, because the effects of the deaths are not only the deaths, but how and when they occur, and their the social dis disruptive effects. We now face um, as the provost suggested to you, uh, a fairly strong view uh, in most public health circles that we are overdue for a pandemic. The last major uh, pandemic was really the 1957 Asian pandemic that killed a couple of million people. There was a milder so-called Hong Kong flu in 1968, which killed 700,000 people. And then, of course, there was the 1976 swine flu, which killed almost no one. Um, uh, and ended up be, being one of those things that caused rather a backlash against public health efforts because of the occurrence of the Guillain-Barre syndrome and a number of the people who had taken the vaccine. But because in historical records it appears that human populations have these waves of pandemics as people get to the point where they have uh, no uh, inborn, uh, acquired, rather no acquired immunity against the um, the, uh, vac the uh, influenza virus, uh, and you get a mutation in one of these A viruses, and the current one that is causing concern is, as most of you probably know, the H5N1, which began appearing in the 1990s in poultry, and it uh, caused concern because of its lethality. Basically, in certain poultry, chickens, it is, uh, as far as I know, virtually 100 percent lethal. If uh, chickens get the flu, they will die from it. Um, on the other hand, other uh, poultry, such as ducks, uh, do not 
uh, acquire the, um, uh, the influenza, but they can be carriers for it and spread it through their feces and so forth. Uh, there was uh, concern then as cases began to arise, and beginning in 1997, the first confirmed cases of H5N1 in uh, human beings occurred. This was, as far as we can tell, uh, a, a rare occurrence connected to very close association with infected chickens. And these would be people who, in handling chickens or handling dead chickens, uh, were massively exposed to the virus. And in those cases, uh, the virus was apparently very lethal. Now, there's always a problem of having an undercounting of people who are infected but don't become Ill, so ill that they end up in a hospital where they are observed. Uh, but among the cases, the hundreds of cases now of confirmed infection, uh, the lethality is at 50 percent. There is no thought uh, among the, the virologists that I know that if the virus mutates and becomes capable of human-to-human -human infection, that you would see uh, a, a rate of mortality anywhere near that. And indeed, things like Ebola, which are very fatal, um, burn themselves out very quickly because they kill everybody who comes in contact with them and there is no route for transmission. But even if we had a virus that was capable of killing one or two percent of all the people infected, and if it were very infectious so that the infection rates were 25 or 50 percent of the population, with a worldwide population of six and a half billion people, you can see that we would be facing the probability of hundreds of millions, perhaps up to three, four, five hundred million uh, deaths. Uh, and that would be on a scale uh, that uh, has not been uh, seen before. Now, at the same time, it's important to recognize that the one thing that would protect people, namely a vaccine, is dependent upon having the actual virus that is causing the human-to-human -human transmission. Some work is now going on with several of the companies to develop an H5N1 virus vaccine, and that will be useful, and of course it's possible already in a version that uh, immunizes uh, poultry to have, uh, a, to stop that virus, but the virus that actually becomes transmissible human to human will be a different virus. It will be a mutation, probably some combination of one of the annual flu viruses uh, and H5N1, and therefore it will be probably four to six months before uh, vaccine production can start from the time that there would be uh, an identification of that virus. And what that will mean is that in the first year, a maximum, if all the vaccine capacity of the world were used, a maximum of 450,000 doses, probably closer, uh, 450 million doses, probably closer to 300 million, uh, which would therefore be enough for only about 5% of the world's population. Now, there are, there are some people who look at what's happened so far in the ability to contain outbreaks among the poultry and to suggest that maybe we will not have the problems uh, that were predicted a couple of years ago. Maybe it will be possible to contain this. And in countries where there have been very effective methods of culling uh, all infected uh, poultry and poultry in the area where you have an outbreak, um, they have been able to cut this short and to prevent further occurrences of human um, cases. But in other, case, other countries uh, where the uh, ability to monitor public and animal health is less extensive, uh, in other parts of Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, in Africa, uh, there, has, there have been cases that have arisen in places where the worry is we could have an outbreak that would get rolling before we have an ability through the surveillance methods uh, to cut it short with the poultry. And, that's really the, the locus of concern. The World Bank has estimated that if there were to be a pandemic, uh, there would be $800 billion in direct economic costs. And as I think you can imagine, the social costs that the bank doesn't begin to calculate are likely to be even greater. <laughs>
most people um, will have heard, most of you in the health-related field, uh, some recitation of some basic principles of bioethics. And those that were set forth in the governmental Belmont report from a presidential commission in 1978 and further elaborated by Tom Beecham and Jim Childress in their Principles of Biomedical Ethics, which is now in something like its fifth edition, um, are uh, usually boiled down to three or four, beneficence and non-maleficence, respect for persons, and justice. And uh, these principles are very useful. I think we need a broader set when we turn to public health, because those are principally the ideas that drive clinical care and clinical research. We need also to attend to the principle of utility, which is acting so as to produce the greatest good, we need to balance that with a principle of fairness. The formal statement of fairness is usually treating like cases alike, and of course, in many contexts, the need to avoid unfair discrimination based on irrelevant or illegitimate characteristics of a person or group. When we, when we deal with public health, we are also concerned with the principle of liberty. That is to say, imposing the least burden on personal self-determination, which is necessary to achieve legitimate goals. That is to say, broadly, not to trade all freedom for security. Given the fact that we're not likely to have full agreement either on those principles or their implications for the facts that we face, it will be equally important to recognize some procedural principles. And the ones that I find the most useful here are first the principle of transparency. Information has to be available to affected populations. And this is a principle which not only rests on ethical, but very much on human rights roots, because there are clear articulations in the international human rights documents of the need to share information, of the right of people to have information about actions which will affect them. It's not enough to have the information, of course. The second principle is one of participation. The affected populations need to be involved in the process of formulating objectives and adopting policies. This will require us to be fairly creative because a lot of the kinds of decisions that are uh, related to the ones we're facing are now ones which are made in, in an invisible fashion. They're made deep in uh, budget appropriations. They're made through processes in hospitals and through what seem to be the technical guidelines that medical associations, uh, groups of doctors put out for practice. When we deal with the application of the notion of participation to pandemic influenza, we are going to need to find a more active way of engaging the community. And I suggest that that is of particular importance in our country, where we rely on a mixed public-private means of delivering health care. In countries that have more of a unified national system of health care, their mechanisms, their governmental mechanisms for deliberation are more directly involved with and responsible for allocation, and people are aware that they are, in effect, all in the same boat, and that there's a limited budget, and we have to have means of allocating it. In our country, we have so many private actors who are making crucial decisions that I think it is even more important if we are going to have policies that will stand up in the face of social disruption caused by a pandemic to have had deliberations that involve people. Another principle is the principle of review and revisability. That is to say, stakeholders should have a means of appealing any decision, and policies and plans should be subject to review and revision in light of experience. And those of us from a legal background are very familiar with this notion. And it is, I think, a very important one Yet we also have to recognize that in the face of an actual pandemic, as opposed to in the process of preparation beforehand, we may have limited ability to engage in a very formal judicial process. Indeed, it's not even clear that in the heart of, an of a pandemic, the courts and other institutions of government would all be open for business as usual. They might not be. And then the question is, what is that process of review and revision 
can we have processes that are not the usual due process of going to a court, but which satisfy the same objectives? And finally, of course, a principle of effectiveness. That is to say, once we go through all this process of developing things, will they be uh, implemented? Now, the, the reason I've suggested these additional principles and framing it in this way is it does seem to me that the usual principalist form of deontology, the Beecham and Childress view, sometimes called the Georgetown mantra, because it gets recited without a lot of thought a lot of the time, particularly the, the notion of uh, respect for persons or autonomy, um, does not suit well some of the concerns of public health and I think that we can draw also on the legal method, which is very much a method of reasoning by analogy, of taking cases that exist and seeing how they can be extended, being aware that that extension becomes a new precedent and itself has to fit within our settled moral judgments. And I take indeed the law at its highest to be a human manifestation of our underlying social commitments and uh, moral commitments so that when we have laws that prevent discrimination and so forth, they don't just spring full blown from the minds of lawyers. They, in their best way and when they are most effective, not only guide people but reflect our, our moral foundations. And I think we're going to face the same process of reasoning by analogy saying if we're doing something different than we've done before, what's the distinction? What's the difference here that makes it sensible to do something different? We not only have to have a set of principles uh, that, are, that come out of uh, ethics, but we have to recognize that in many settings, particularly, of course, in countries that have a tradition of greater reliance on human rights instruments as opposed to our own reliance on our constitution, that there are obligations of governments. And I'll talk a little bit later about how those would have an application uh, in this arena. Finally, in addition to using these ethical principles and analyses to judge the moral rightness of decisions, Ethicists can also have a role in bringing out the ethics that are buried in um, supposedly technical arguments. For example, looking at a lot of the uh, pandemic plans that have been developed by countries around the world, uh, very heavily the European countries are quite far along in all of this, uh, many of them begin with the assumption stated as their objective as saving the most lives. And this might seem very straightforward. Isn't that what public health is all about? Uh, yet, in a way, that will, if applied literally, give you a preference for treating certain people. And indeed, the, the usual way you would save the most lives are treat the healthiest. That is to say, someone who has only recently developed the symptoms of flu and is otherwise healthy. If you treat them, if you give them the antiviral, the Tamiflu, the chance that they will survive is very great. That's different than a very common medical view, which is to treat the sickest. If we allocate uh, organs right now, for example, oh, they usually go to people who get to the top of the list in part because their need is the most urgent. And sometimes that coincides with the notion that they've been waiting the longest, but someone could go right to the top of the list if they developed a very bad, irreversible, acute problem, a liver failure, and there was nothing else uh, that could save them. There are all sorts of different standards that can be used, and so something which I think a lot of the public health people took as unproblematic may be the right choice, but we should recognize that it has implications for who is treated, and it is, in effect, an ethical choice in itself. So let's go through those four topics. And as I say, I'll spend a little more time on the first one than the others um, in this kind of zooming train ride through these issues. I think that the question of access actually uh, implicates three questions. When we talk about fair distribution, we're talking first about what kind of justice is going to be sought. There are various forms. There's compensatory justice, which usually, your, your torts class is probably thinking about that, um, worries about making up for a special burden that a person has borne. And 
uh, reference was made to that Bellagio statement. Uh, a good deal of what we were looking at there was not the human side, but the animal side of uh, avian influenza. And the question, what is owed to the farmers? And is there a, a reason to differentiate between someone who is running a large industrial scale poultry operation, who has a potential large economic loss, but probably has an investment base and a financial base to survive, versus the small farmer who makes his living with chickens, but has a, a relatively small number of them, versus a family that has three or four chickens, which provides their major source of protein through the eggs and occasionally butchering one of the chickens. And in each of these cases, one's response to what is owed, what would be good compensation in order, from a prudential point of view, to induce them to cooperate since a lot of this depends upon voluntarily acknowledging, A, that you have the poultry, you haven't hidden them away, and B, that they're, that they're showing signs of illness or dying. These are the kinds of questions then which combine both an ethical and a prudential aspect. But what compensation is due? And would it vary depending upon the circumstances? There's distributional forms of justice or fairness looking to equalize the burdens and benefits that are involved. And here, the question is always, do we look beyond the immediate problem? That is to say, this person is hurt by what is happening right now to the underlying question of distribution of welfare in society. So there are those like Rawls who would argue that that is the correct way of operating. And so we always want to operate so as to make the, the worst off better off relative to the rest of us. And this would then have obvious implications for the distribution of the uh, flu vaccine or the Tamiflu to those who are either sickest, that's one form of worse off, or poorest and have less access to, less enjoyment of the benefits of living in our society. And then finally, we also talk about justice in the procedural sense, that we have fair processes. And that doesn't mean just processes that treat people equally, but also processes that enjoy transparency and reviewability and participation and so forth. The next question embedded in the question of fair distribution is what is the basis of comparison? Is it comparing lives? Is it comparing well-being rather than lives themselves? Is it comparing the social or economic impact of an action as against what would happen if we didn't act? And finally, what is the context? I've been using the word allocation here because it is the word that's most often used. But in some ways, I think it's misleading. Because in a way, the word allocation suggests that we're engaged in the kind of normal process by which we try to use resources most effectively. And all of us do this in our own families. You have children. You try to allocate your time and your money in a way that's fair to the needs of each. They don't have all comparable needs or at any one stage in their life their needs are not equal. And you make those judgments as to what would be fair in that way. You're allocating. But you're not assuming that any of your children are going to starve, or any of your children are not going to be educated, or any of your children are going to be lacking your love and attention. You're going to give some to all of them. All of them will have something that they need. But we may be faced with something which is really not allocation, but it's rationing. That is to say, it is making choices where we have good things we can do that if we don't do, people will face very bad results, disability and death. And we will not be able to, to intervene with an awful lot of them, probably worldwide, 80, 90 percent would not get that intervention. And even in our own country, a huge proportion would not, particularly if the flu strikes soon, because we were very slow to get around as a national government to putting in our orders with Roche for all that Tamiflu. And we're not first in line uh, to get it. We have very low stocks on a per capita basis compared to a lot of the other developed countries. And so we will face what seems to me not a question of allocation, but rationing. Now, you may say, aren't those two words just more or less the same. I think so. They're very close. But the suggestion I want to suggest to you is that it is 
a different thought process because of the fact that there will be some people who will really get nothing other than being told, stay home, stay hydrated, don't infect other people, but don't expect us to give you treatment. We cannot do it. We're dealing with others who have been prioritized for one reason or another. I'm not seeming to get any reaction from this. There we go. Now, what is the basis uh, for making the allocations? And one way uh, has been a, an argument that because of our commitment as a country and because of our ethical traditions of valuing all lives the same, that we actually should not use a discriminating basis. And indeed, some people suggest a lottery, drawing a lot is back to biblical times, the notion of a fair way that somehow, for those of you who take a view that God guides the hand, what comes up in the lottery would be a reflection of divine will. For others who say, well, at least it gives everybody a priori and equal shot, it seems fair. When we've been talking about a principle of utility, however, the suggestion is, well, that is going to miss something. Is there any way of combining the two? And one way of doing that is a view associated with Ronald Dworkin uh, with his concept of equal regard. And what that says is in certain circumstances, our actions towards people are not going to be exactly equal. But we begin from a presumption of equal respect and concern for all. And we don't devalue anyone's life. And that has some implications then for the next two categories that are here the notion of medical utility and social utility. Medical utility is something that's very familiar to, to doctors in all sorts of triage situations, in hospitals, uh, in emergency rooms, and also to public health people. The idea is medical utility looks at what an intervention can do for the people who are at greatest risk and, and decides on the potential to benefit them. And you can have, as I've already suggested, different outcomes from that, but it's looking at what the medical indications are and what difference the medical intervention will make. The idea of social utility is different. That then says, are there certain lives of greater social worth because of their contribution to society and the like? And it is that idea which is most directly in tension with either a pure version of equality or even with Dworkin's view of equal regard. But there may be another way of looking as we focus our question of social utility, not getting into a business of saying some people are worth more than, than others to society as a general matter, but recognizing that a pandemic with that need to ration and the need to make choices when not everyone is going to be saved or benefited is like a lifeboat. And in a lifeboat, you need someone who can steer the boat. And that's one of the people that you're going to make judgments about. And there may be other people that you make judgments about. So I want to look at two different things for a little bit. I want to look at medical utility and social utility. And to look at medical utility, I want to begin with um, an interesting exercise. I seem to be going the wrong way here. An interesting exercise developed by some colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health, principally Professor Dan Brock. And uh, what he suggests is, let's suppose, he, he was doing this for the Massachusetts Department of Health to get them to think this through. Let's suppose that there's a novel strain of influenza A uh, which has uh, affected people in your community. And there are now 500 cases and 50 deaths, a high mortality rate, 10%. And uh, Tamiflu is the only drug that will be effective to reduce the mortality of the ill patients. However, the supplies are limited and the hospitals across the country are independently making decisions. In this hypothetical community, suppose there are four major academic medical centers and that they've established these four different policies. The first is Hospital A which recognizes the importance of protecting its workforce in order to minimize absenteeism and ensure continuous response capacity. And so it's decided to use its remaining cash of Tamiflu for prophylaxis of the staff who are exposed while caring for influenza patients. That is 
that one extreme on the lifeboat idea. These are the people who are steering the boat. Hospital B, in an effort to save its very ill patients, Hospital B has decided to reserve its remaining cash of Tamiflu for treatment of the sickest influenza patients. This approach is consistent with the usual practice of the providers at Hospital B who are accustomed to focusing primarily on treatment. Hospital B is relying on airborne infection isolation and personal protective equipment namely the N95 respirators, gloves, and gowns to protect its staff, and is not using Tamiflu for prophylaxis. In order to maximize survival rates, Hospital C has decided to reserve its remaining cash of Tamiflu for treatment of the patients most likely to benefit, namely those who present within 48 hours of disease onset. This plan will deplete their stock faster, and so they are not using it for prophylaxis. And Hospital D, assuming that its cache of Tamiflu will soon be depleted regardless of the distribution strategy, is using the antiviral for prophylaxis of exposed staff and treatment of all probable and confirmed cases. This is obviously the uh, most comprehensive approach, and so it will reach its limits the fastest. So which is right? If we had enough time and you all had those little magical clickers or something here, I'd, we could take a vote. Hospital A, Hospital B, Hospital C, Hospital D. And there are reasons why each of these might appeal to you. So the first question is, given that probability that different ones appeal to different of you, can we take these independently and simply say that each is fair and reasonable, although each is different? But viewed in the context of the community, what are some potential challenges that may arise as the result of the different institutions utilizing these different strategies? If the strategies are, as they probably should be, transparent, then won't we just have a distribution of the cases to those hospitals that are most uh, likely to treat? So if you're very sick to start off with, most likely to die, you'll go to one hospital. If you're most likely to benefit you go to another. If you're a healthcare worker, you want to be at Hospital A. Um, hospital D apparently will take all comers, just get in line as soon as possible. So that doesn't sound very coordinated. So should it be made at the hospital level or at a community level? level? And if so, is that a process led by public health officials? What about at a state level? Or is this something where we ought to regard this as a national problem and have a national policy so that we don't get this uh, competition and diversity. Now, some people have suggested that going beyond this kind of uh, rationalization based on medical differences, how sick the person is, how, and so forth, um, we ought to emphasize social utility. And Hospital A was doing that to a certain extent because they were treating their own uh, healthcare workers first. There have been several uh, attempts at this, mostly around uh, initially stimulated by the question of the seasonal flu because, as you recall, in 2004, I guess, 2005, uh, we had a huge shortage of the seasonal flu vaccine because one of the factories that was responsible for manufacturing it did not pass the FDA uh, requirements and we were suddenly very short. And so at that point, various um, vi uh, vaccine-related groups put out standards, and almost all of them say, and, and certainly would be true in a pandemic, that there has to be prioritization for the healthcare workers and the vaccine workers because their uh, uh, health is crucial to the functioning of the healthcare system as a whole. And many people within that say, well, that doesn't mean every doctor. You know, I'm sorry, Mr. Um, cosmetic Surgeon, you don't qualify unless you give up cosmetic surgery and become a public health official for the interim. But um, those people who are on the front lines, this is not as far as the best predictions go, like SARS, where it is very unlikely to get the disease in the community, and it's very likely to get it if you're a healthcare worker. Uh, traditionally, there is a greater exposure. I mean, Ebola mostly affects a few people in the community, and then the healthcare workers who come in to take care of them have a very high mortality rate. Uh, probably the, the chance of getting influenza is going to be 
more or less equal. So it's not that the frontline workers are at that much greater risk, although they, they may be at somewhat greater risk. Um, and indeed, uh, we, we'd have to know the facts before we decide on which policy. But assuming that it's a community-based acquisition, we still have concern not of paying them back for, for tr their willingness to treat, but just keeping them able to treat. But after that, who gets priority? And some people have argued uh, for a life cycle principle, uh, something that Norm Daniels, the philosopher, calls a fair innings principle. And that is to equalize everyone's chance to live through each stage of life. The, the furthest implication of that would be that you would treat six months old in preference to one year olds, in preference to two year olds, and so forth, because each group would then, by having uh, access to the vaccine, have the better chance of being able to move on to the next stage in their life. But uh, that, that has some very odd implications. One implication is that we would have an awful lot of healthy little orphans uh, because all their parents and grandparents would be dead. And uh, Zeke Emanuel and uh, colleagues at uh, the National Institutes of Health argue, therefore, for um, a m refinement of the uh, life cycle principle based on preservation of public order and what they call an investment refinement. And their argument is that up until about the age of 13, you would not give preference, but that people from their teenage years to about 40 who are at a stage where they have invested and others have invested a great deal in them, that's what we should be trying to preserve. So it turns thing around and says, up until then, you don't have the life cycle principle, the fair innings operating. At that point, you do, and it's in part the notion of investment. The problem pushing that very far is it becomes that, that view of social worth in a way, because social investment is a way of saying the, the likely reward from that investment to society. Let me go very quickly through the other topics. Um, the, 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 the second topic, as I mentioned, is the question of public health. There are all sorts of measures, quarantining exposed people, isolation of sick persons, social distancing, that is to say closing down the malls, telling people not to go out in public, uh, not having church services and so forth, border control to keep the movement internationally, and various measures of, of personal hygiene uh, wearing masks and so forth. Um, it's not clear how effective ordinary masks are, but, it, but they may have some effect. Obviously, a fundamental question in all of this will be, do we have the evidence that these things are going to work in this circumstance? And if so, how do we compare the burdens that they impose on individuals? In this, I think that uh, Jim Childress has very usefully argued that what we want are uh, those measures to be taken which are most likely to express community rather than to impose community. And so if we look at what happened when Toronto was faced with SARS, they relied very heavily on voluntary quarantine. The people who were exposed voluntarily stayed home. If we're going to have that work, we have to have a system which is in place to support the people. So you have to, if you're, if you're staying at home so as not to expose people, somebody has to get you what you need, whether it's your other medicines or food and water or whatever. We have to, therefore, find a way of expressing the community to support that voluntary action. We may, however, be dealing with something where we have to go beyond voluntary actions. And one of the questions will then be, going back to those hospital ABCs, is do we need some way of treating the, the relevant vaccines and drugs as community resources to be actually allocated by some choice rather than just what anybody can get their, their hands on? And likewise, would there be a, a national plan of distribution so if the uh, the conditions start showing up in some places and not others and we lockdown to the extent we can on people traveling, target our resources, and try to slow down the spread of the, the disease. Always, of course, we're looking for the least restrictive alternative among interventions and being made by people who have the authority under the law to do so 
using the best evidence. What about obligations of and to healthcare workers? As I suggested when I introduced this topic, this is something where there are different rationales for uh, saying that people with these special skills have special obligations. Part of this is the notion, going back to Hippocrates and uh, the epidemics, is to say that the doctor's obligation to patients in ordinary circumstances extends to those patients and to the community uh, in need. And there are, throughout history, um, great stories of physicians who were the last to leave in the face of the plague and so forth. Um, in more recent years, physicians have expressed a lot of anxiety, uh, more or less like soldiers signing up for the peacetime army and finding themselves fighting uh, without adequate protection in a war. They feel, I've been asked to take on risks which weren't part of my bargain when I became a doctor. And in the early years of the AIDS epidemic, when there was a lot of anxiety in the medical community, how can we protect ourselves and so forth, a lot of doctors said, I'm just not going to treat HIV positive patients. The, the medical community came together and eventually said, no, that's not the right approach. If the, the standard for physicians should be within your practice abilities, you have an obligation to, to not to turn away patients because they are HIV positive. And indeed, you ought to be using the means that would protect you against uh, infection with all your patients so that you don't infect them and they don't infect you because you may not know who's HIV positive. And I think that has now become more the norm, but I know from teaching medical students that there are some who still are choosing uh, what branch of medicine to go into, what specialty to have, because they don't want to take on those risks. And so the question then is, is this a part of being a very privileged person in society, having had this education, and in effect being part of a social contract? Or is it simply that in times of need, we would be drafting people? And we'd be drafting the delivery men and the cleaning workers as well as the doctors, because the hospitals and, and uh, the, the society are not going to work without that. And that then becomes a, a, a question. Linked with the obligations of the healthcare professionals are the obligations to them if they are placed at greater than community level risk. And uh, obviously, in the end, we would be better served with voluntary participation and regarding this as a supererogatory act, an act of uh, sacrifice to a certain extent, rather than an obligatory act that is mandated. Uh, but in all cases, whichever it is, we must uh, provide to physicians and nurses and others who are uh, engaged in this work the means to make it as reasonably safe as possible. Um, I'm going the wrong direction. Finally, just a few words about the international. Um, there are obligations which uh, rest on national governments, but it's important to recognize these are not solely obligations under the human rights instruments to other governments. They are obligations to the populations who are at uh, great risk and who face a humanitarian crisis. The UN Charter talks about the principles of the UN to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of humanitarian character. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about the respect for economic, social, and cultural rights, including matters of health, which are indispensable for human dignity, and proclaims they should be realized through national effort and international uh, cooperation. One of the problems with these uh, statements is that they are rather vague on their implementation, and they are focused largely on long-term development so that they talk about progressive realization of these rights. There are really also, within these documents, no criteria for judging how a state should assess the extent of its obligations and to whom such obligations attach. And it's obvious that governments are most likely to act if they know that other governments are acting, so that when there is inaction and the greatest need, the inaction feeds on itself. Practically, the ability of states to respond appropriately 
depends on several things. First, that they are aware of the problem and the threat that it poses, that they possess the knowledge that enables them to control the problem, and that they have the logistical, administrative, and financial capacity to act effectively. Reciprocally, their obligation to respond depends on the extent to which their own capacity to deal with the problems in their own country exceeds that which is probably going to be necessary that there is a means for organized international response and, and this is the crucial part, that the recipient countries have themselves set up effective and equitable systems. Because while it seems to me that American leaders should be prepared in the face of a pandemic to say, we have to take some additional risks here at home by sharing our financial, our logistical, our human, and our medical resources with countries that are facing the first wave of a pandemic, we would feel very hard justifying that if the regimes to which those supplies went did not have effective ways of using the supplies that they were, as it were, rotting on the docks waiting for use, or that they were going to be used in a very inequitable fashion. They were going to be used for an elite or for a military or not for the general population. And so the very countries where the need will be the greatest and the exposure of people to inequitable and vulnerable situations is the greatest may be the ones which will be the hardest to aid because they're really, it's very difficult totally to go around the government, although the obligation is to those populations. And if there are means through NGOs and so forth to reach those populations, it seems to me they have a very strong moral claim. I've suggested to you that all of these various examples are examples of individual versus group interests. And therefore, part of the communication is recognizing the scarcity and, resu and the resulting need for collective action. It seems to me that we ought, as a country, to engage in what Irving Janis years ago called, in a different context, a context of individual choices about health care, as the work of worrying, the need to anticipate and work through a problem in advance. And in the clinical context, I sometimes hear from physicians the view, well, I don't want to worry my patients unnecessarily. I don't want to give them details of all the bad things that could happen. They're so improbable. But what Janice found was that wasn't harmful to people. That indeed, going through that process left no residual harm if those things didn't arise. People didn't just start developing every symptom they'd ever heard could happen. But conversely, where they hadn't engaged in the work of worrying, then the upset of dealing with the reality was much greater. And I think as a community and as a country and internationally through WHO, we need that process now. All of the ethical issues really are species of this question of individual versus group. The interest of country A versus the community at large. The interest of people to be vaccinated versus the herd. The interest of the person who wants access to Tamiflu versus the interests of those who are judged to have priority, the interests of subjects in clinical trials versus the interests of people who receive a vaccine or drug after the trial process. As is always true with ethical dilemmas, even more than with following human rights norms, we're dealing here with a bunch of choices where we have goods competing with each other. There is no simple solution to this, and therefore, reasoning publicly debated is going to lead to varied outcomes, but the test is not the incontrovertibility, but the public understanding and acceptance of whatever those outcomes are. In the end, I think we come back to what Guido Calabresi and Phil Bobbitt in their book, Tragic Choices, talked about in the context of allocation, but I think applies more broadly. Achieving the moral foundations and preserving the moral foundations of our social collaboration. It is clear, therefore, that the process will be very important in dealing with allocation decisions. The standards need to be articulated, publicly debated, and justified. The greater barrier in our context and around the world to success may be public skepticism about the fairness or a perception of actual discrimination, particularly when such discrimination already occurs in healthcare for many populations. And so we have to put that issue on the table 
and our desire to avoid that discrimination, but we have to elevate the conversation above that. And I think that is a process in which those of you who come from law or will be in law certainly have a role. Those of you who come from medicine and public health recognize your role, obviously. But I think more than that, it is something about which we all need a frank and informed discussion. And I hope that uh, these remarks are helpful to you in framing some of the issues that that discussion must address. Thank you. a lot about the, the uh, giving the public the chance to worry, about getting going on the work of worrying. Uh, and that's something that we worry about a lot because it's not so easy to get started. Um, it has to do with the, the whole business of, of, of doing transparency and, and uh, um, uh, helping the public to get involved in decisions of how we're going to allocate scarce resources and how we're going to impose limitations of personal freedom. Uh, in order to, to contain spread in the community, uh, isolation uh, when, when you're sick, <coughs> school closings, terrible dilemma. Um, and uh, we've been holding public meetings in every county uh, called uh, summits to, to try and get uh, groups of the public involved. They've been going on since this last late spring. And uh, my own personal take is that it's not easy. Um, there seems to be a period of sinking in and getting, getting a sense this is real and understanding some of the realities before you can start worrying effectively. And uh, we have not, I think, really been that successful in getting a public debate going, except in certain professional groups and in certain businesses and in certain, certain subgroups of the population that, that uh, had a chance to understand this better and we can focus more on. So do you have any thoughts on, on to what extent it's, it's necessary to really get this worrying widely out, and especially to the people who are less powerful and receive less communication and haven't heard as much about it? And how do you do it? Well, your question raises three points to me. The first, I totally agree with. We know that it's very hard to get people to engage in things that are not right before them. And when I talk about the work of worrying, I'm not talking about the work of panic. That is to say, I don't think that a Michael Crichton approach is probably the right one here, just to have everybody worrying about a superbug escaping. Uh, it is possible to, to get attention to this. Now, obviously, it, some of the attention in recent years has come about after dramatic events. Uh, we worried about bioterrorism after 9-11, and when we had the anthrax scare in those cases, uh, it was possible to get people saying, well, what do I need to do to protect there? What steps are being taken? How safe are things? The second thing that you emphasize is the, the need to reach out, actually, at the grassroots level and have small discussions of people. And I think that is going to vary from community to community, what are the natural modes of discussion? Since many of these issues are issues that are, will affect people in their schools, because school closures are going to be a major thing, it seems to me using PTAs, or whatever the South Carolina equivalent of that is, if that's not the right word, uh, is, is one idea. And developing a set of lay materials that, that uh, people could be, a few people could be trained to use, and then have these discussions. Uh, many of the questions here are obviously questions about uh, fairness to human beings and so forth. And our faith traditions are all full of views about that. So again, <coughs> finding religious education leaders and so forth and making this something that will be talked about in church groups and the like. Part of what needs to go on here, and this is my third point, is the realization that in that process, I suspect we will learn a lot of things because people will see and that, that work of worrying will get them to worry about things that maybe are not the first things 
to occur to people. Uh, one thing that maybe you all, I know you're in public health, maybe you thought of, but I have, would never have thought of, is one of the reasons that cited for people not leaving New Orleans was because they didn't have any way of transporting their pets. And some people stayed behind or delayed long enough that they were caught because they said, I can't, if there's going to be a flood, I can't take all my animals, but I can't leave them. Okay, so if there was some discussion in this area about what this is going to mean in the community, and you've got some people thinking, we might get some ideas bubbling up. Oh, we've got a problem we have to anticipate. We have to plan for what to do about that because this is how people are really going to be worried. And I don't know. I'm not going to suggest a new one you hadn't thought of. My point is, I wouldn't know how to think of it, and maybe you wouldn't need it, even though you're in the public health field, because these things come up from a community level. And, and so it's both the difficulty, I mean, how do we get people to change their diet? It's very hard to get people to think. How do we get teenagers not to smoke? Well, it turned out, from what I know, it's much more effective to get people to stop smoking if you tell them their breath smells bad and no one wants to be around them, than that they'll get cancer in 30 years or 40 years. That doesn't, and the notion that, oh, there might be something coming along like this, it is hard to get people's attention. But it's real enough, and that you know, there, there are the reports of deaths around the world and so forth. I think we could get people's attention realistically. Um, there was a good deal of attention two years ago when we were very short of the seasonal flu, and that was in every newspaper all the time, and different communities. You saw people lining up at hospitals. Even, I think, one or two people died waiting in line because they were already very frail people. So that got people's attention. Reminding people of that and saying, now, how are we going to deal if it's a much bigger problem with much fewer resources? I think we could get people's attention. But I'm not surprised that you've tried and found it difficult. Um, we're lucky here. I think we have the resources to do that. I'm much more worried, frankly, giving this advice to countries where the health system is hanging on by its fingertips. And I'm not sure it's entirely ethical to tell them that they should spend a lot of resources on what is only a possibility. I mean, you could be here two years from now and say, remember that crazy guy who came through and talked about pandemic influenza? Well, they've now wiped out H5N1 and we're not going to have a pandemic. Ha ha, what a fool he was. And I would feel particularly badly if this were Uganda instead of South Carolina, because I'm not sure their public health officials should be spending a lot of time on this compared to immediate needs. We have the luxury that we do have the resources to address this and do other important public health work, in my view at least. We have those resources. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I was just interested in um, if there's been any uh, talk about, you know, right now there's a lot of worry about uh, things like a pandemic coming about, and there's a lot of media saturation on the topic. Um, and so is there any worry in the uh, public health uh, world uh, that, that it will be so saturated now that the farther it gets before we were to have an actual outbreak, that there's going to be a pro like almost a desensitization process? where people won't, uh, I'm talking about this, the public in particular, not necessarily officials, that they won't take it as seriously when it, when it does start to, um, you know, spread like, you know, just a few cases here and there, but is there, is there a worry that people won't take it as seriously because they've been hearing about it for so long? Let me give you an answer which isn't based on empirical uh, work. I can't tell you. I haven't done questioning of, of people who do uh, like the, the, the Pew Center that does all those public opinion polls. I don't know if they've tried to figure out how they would answer that. I suppose that if we had only worries and didn't know what to do with it, eventually either you get tired of the worry when the thing doesn't happen, or you, as you put it, become desensitized and just stop worrying and don't notice whether it's happening. I don't think we're dealing with that kind of a situation. And I think that if we had responses that people could see, now we've talked about it. We saw that there was a problem. We got together. And we know, if we're in this community that has these four hospitals, that they've debated among themselves. And they've decided that they need one common policy for our community. And this is what it's going to be. And we recognize that that will mean that certain people get treated and others won't. But we know why we got to that point, And this was not just a few doctors making a decision behind closed doors. That's different. And then if you get to the point where it comes up, of course, the people who will be 
as it were, on the losing end of whatever that calculation is, may say, oh, gee, I'm still not really happy with it. But I think we have experience. I know in the HIV area, some work that's been done in Africa, uh, where they face the same question about not having enough of the antiretroviral treatments for everybody who was going to need treatment. They still have that problem. That where there have been these community discussions and people feel that their concerns were taken into account, Dworkin's idea of equal respect and concern, then they can live more because of that fair process with an outcome with which they may disagree. And it's where rules seem to come out of nowhere and they don't seem to have taken account of the views of people that you're most likely to have unhappiness with them. And in this case, unhappiness can mean social disruption, either civil disobedience in the sense people go off and get their hands on Tamiflu even though they're not supposed to have it because they're not at the priority list. They get their doctor to write a prescription and the doctor agrees because he likes this patient or whatever. Or um, actual social disruption in the sense of people marching in the streets and you know, trying to break down the hospital doors, not obeying rules. If, if it is very likely that the rule of social distancing will mean if you're sick, don't come to the hospital because we, we're going to face a lot of problems in the hospital and we don't want to spread this disease that everybody coming into the hospital is exposed to it. So stay at home and here's the mechanisms we have to take care of people who are at home. Here's the number you call to say, I need my groceries delivered or whatever. If we have those things in place, we're more likely to have success. If we don't, and then we get people disobeying the rules of social distancing and so forth because they don't see why they should. Why me? I'm not, I don't buy into this. I don't think it was fair. I don't know how you got to this point. It's a stupid rule. Those are when you have problems. So I'd be worried if we only had worrying, but if we have worrying and then transparent policies come out of that process with ground up participation, I, I don't think we should worry that that will desensitize us. It will prepare us. Last response. Uh, it's not clear to me whether you are suggesting that uh, uh, it doesn't make any difference which of these allocational principles one applies, so long as there's transparency. Is is that your basic contention, or do you favor one allocation principle over another, or have some priority among them? Well, um, I wasn't saying that, in my view, all are equal. I have particular problems with ones which would use outright social utility as the criterion. And one of the problems I therefore have with Zeke Emanuel's view of this investment um, refinement to the life cycle principle, this notion of fair innings, uh, is that it does seem to me to carry the seeds of saying some people are, are more valuable to society because we've invested a lot in them and we haven't reaped that fully. So that people who are younger and haven't had the investment are more dispensable. People who are older, who've had their life chance and maybe aren't as productive anymore, are dispensable. And, we, and that, that does worry me. Um, but, but I'm not as worried by a more focused lifeboat sort of view of utility that says we do need to keep broadly understood frontline people able to do their jobs because to a certain extent, our, our health system, the ability to manufacture vaccines, to distribute them, the, the ability to give nursing and, and medical care to people is going to be very important for saving lives. And therefore, we need the core available. And as I say, I didn't restrict that to the narrow traditional professions of nursing and medicine. I, I would say the people who are in the hospital, cleaning the hospital, the people who are um, the morticians who are taking care of dead bodies and so forth, that's all part of that system that needs to be in place. And that focus kind of hand on the tiller of the, of the lifeboat seems to me different than saying, well, a, a group of people are, are better. Within any group, if we, if we only had, say, 100 million doses of vaccine, we might not even be able to treat everybody within Zeke Emanuel's preferred uh, investment, uh, life investment group, um, we would still need lotteries. I think across the, the lifespan we need that. But we do need a sensible approach. And it's here that I would turn to the community again. And I can imagine some communities um, saying, you know, we really would prefer to let the children go first. 
And we think we will have enough, given the way this illness strikes, we will have enough people who will be caretakers. And even if a child were to lose both its parents, we know we will take care of them. We don't abandon. And other communities saying, we want to make sure that in every family there's a, uh, a parent who survives. So when you treat children, you've got to treat one of their parents to, to, give, to maximize that. I mean, I can imagine differences there. And it doesn't seem to me that one of those is automatically right and the other. They do depend on social circumstances. And certainly, looking internationally, I would, I would say that we should be willing to regard as, a, as an equitable system to which we would give some of our scarce resources, one which would reach a different judgment that we might reach because of that society's traditions. And for example, a society that very much venerates the elderly because very few people make it through to old age there. And they say, we want to protect them as well and not just give it to the 20 and 30 year olds. I would say if, if that is consistent with their society and they've gone through a fair process and this really represents not just the few people with power in the community, the elders, but really represents the community, I would be satisfied with that. Having those kinds of democratic processes around the world may be a dream. It may not happen everywhere. I think we can do a lot of it here. I think there are many countries that can do that. It seems to me that because our health system is going to face more and more issues that aren't just issues of allocation, but are of rationing, because the ability of the health system to do more of benefit than we can afford, this exercise of recognizing our common interest in the fair allocation of resources can have benefit even if we never have a pandemic. It seems to me this is looking at a specific set of facts, but we're going to face these questions with every passing year more and more. How do we decide when not to spend something because the marginal benefit of doing it for this category of illnesses with this category of patients is not worth where else those resources could be better spent. And I think that to the extent that we recognize this as something where we have a common interest and we ought to have discussions about it, that's all to the good. So I don't think this is in any case going to be wasted. But particularly if we have a pandemic, I think it's going to be essential for that social cohesion and that uh, preservation of what Calabresi and Bobbitt called the moral foundations of our um, social collaboration. Thank you so much. We're going to take some more questions up here, but uh, there's a reception in the lawyer's room at the library, and there's the things to drink over there. So thank you so much for coming. Sorry that my answers were so long-winded.